Hi, everybody. My name is Marlon Cobos, and I'm a PhD student in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Kansas. Today, I'm going to present a brief description of the KUNM package with some examples of its application in R. The topics of this presentation are the following. What is KUNM? Why and how this package was developed? What you can do with KUNM? How to do use the package? And a practice in R and interpretation of, of the results. Starting with what is KUNM? Let's say that KNM is an R package that contains a set of tools that help to develop rigorous models using the matching algorithm. KNM is open source and you can find it in the GitHub repository in the link below. The name of the package derives from the way we refer to the Ecological Niche Modeling Group at KU, the University of Kansas. And it summarizes what we have learned using Maxim many, many times during the last years. We started developing KNM in 2018 when a series of questions and needs motivated us to start producing tools to model ecological niches and species dist potential distributions using Maxim. Although some tools like ENM tools and ENM eval already existed, we wanted to do certain things differently. And we wanted to make tools that have been developed that have been developed in the group more accessible to other researchers. Among the questions that motivated us are what will happen if other metrics are used to evaluate models and uh, the need of automating some processes that weren't automated till the time. Initially, uh, and considering what KUNM can do, uh, this package took care of these processes, model calibration, final model production and evaluation, and extrapolation risk analysis. We weren't too concerned about processes like gathering data, occurrence data cleaning, or pre-processing of filtering variables because of two main reasons. First, there are already many tools that help to perform these processes. And second, those processes as the most important ones when doing ecological niche or species distribution modeling are among the most complex to perform. And we thought that trying to automate those uh, processes will, will have been counterproductive. Uh, lately, other tools have been added to KUNM, and they are focused in helping to perform some of the post-modeling analysis that could be needed when dealing with uh, multiple models or uh, multiple results. For example, model consensus, model variability, detection of changes in projections, and so on. Model calibration is one of the main things in KUNM, and it basically consists in testing model performance of candidate models that were created with distinct parameter settings in Maxim. For example, feature classes and regularization multipliers. But we were also interested in the effect of distinct sets of variables in those models. Because we never know if the sets of variables that we decided were actually the best ones but we always have a good set of candidate variables for our models. So KNM also helps to see which of those candidate sets of variables will be better to produce our models. So from this example, we'll be evaluating 1,050 candidate models. And after testing, those models with distinct metrics. The question then remains is which models are good? And for us, uh, we think that all models with results that are better than random, random expectations that have good and have good predictive ability are good. But from those, 
the ones that we pick are the ones that have low complexity, but also fit well the data. So the metrics we use for like this test, test are partial rock for statistical significance of models, omission rates for measuring predictive ability, and uh, AKK information criterion corrected for small sample sizes for measuring uh, fitting of data, but mainly complexity. Uh, after model calibration, you can obtain results like the ones presented here. And you can see that the scenario can be very different. For one species, there are a lot of non-significant models. And for the other one, there's no non-significant models. So what changes? Well, each species is different and each species has different occurrences, but also uh, each species should be calibrated in an area that is relevant for the statistical process that is going to be performed but also related to what we have learned as the M in the BAM diagram, the accessible areas for the species, because those are actually the relevant environments uh, to which the species have had the chance to uh, face or access. So what was the difference here is that for the first species, the M was easy to calculate and uh, this M is a good representation of the for a calibration area because it contains environments that are suitable for the species but also some environments that are close to those areas that are suitable but are really different in terms of environmental conditions. And for the other species, the species in B, uh, we had a very limited accessible area and that area is the only one that we can use for uh, calibration. And in that area, most of environments are suitable for the species with very few exceptions. So when we calibrate these kind of models in areas like that one or for species like that one, which present something like what we call the wall stream in the BAM configuration, uh, there's a lot of risks of obtaining non-significant models. And by the way, this significance was tested with the partial rock analysis. But when you test it with the normal area under the curve, all values for these models were above, were above 0 0.5, which will indicate that they are significant. So once you have those results, you know which ones are the models that you select. And those are here presented inside the red box. And you can compare what you have after model selection with what you have gotten if you if you decided to go with a like default parameterization of maxim. And as you can see, all values are different and omission rates are way above the allowed omission rate that we decided to go for 0 0.5, 0 0.05. And they are also more complex in terms of AACC. So model selection makes a difference in your models and it makes your models more reliable in some sense. KNM also allows you to test the models using independent records. And what that, what that means is that after you calibrate your model, you decide which ones met the criteria for selection. And you may also have independent records, records that were not used during model calibration, but that are very good for testing whether your models are good enough to predict data or that does not present the same kind of bias that the first, that the one that was used first during calibration. So in this example, after doing that test, uh, the statistical significance and omission rates of the later tests detected that this model here wasn't good enough. So we decided to go with the other ones. So now you have good final models, models that were good during model calibration and also 
models that uh, were good with test after testing with independent data. And you can produce those models with replicates and with the same type of outputs to inject next to see the contribution of variables and things like that. But you can also project the models to geographic areas that are not the calibration area. And when you do that, you have options for uh, extrapolation of suitability values. And those three options here are pre-extrapolation, extrapolation and clamping, and no extrapolation at all. And you can see the differences uh, of doing one or the other here geographically. And KUNM is very good in allowing you to produce all of them in at once and see and explore what are the effects of taking the decision of using one type of extrapolation or the other. KNM also helps you to summarize results. As you may have, uh, as you may have think, model, models can produce different outputs and while calibrating the models, you can end up with more than one best model or more than one selected model. When you have that, you have to produce kind of a consensus among results. But also you have to represent how variable were the conditions. So you need a central tendency and a dispersion of your results. And to do that, KNM allows you to calculate those descriptive statistics listed there. And the way it does is it considers distinct models and produces those uh, statistics for the distinct areas of projection, calibration area and the other ones. KNM also uh, helps you to represent variability in results and variability can be represented in many different ways, but uh, KNM deals at least with three of, of those. So imagine you're doing a projection to the future and you generally end up with projection to distinct emission scenarios, which will be something like greenhouse gas emission scenarios, and generally with multiple general circulation models for uh, representing climate, uh, the GCMs. So when you have that, you will for sure end up with different representations of your models in the future in the geography. And that means that distinct GCMs will give you distinct results. Distinct RCPs will give you distinct results. And trying to summarize those multiple conditions could be hard. And KNM helps you to do something like what you're saying now. So look at the stable region, which indicates that current and future predictions of suitable areas were the same. But then you can see that gain and loss has distinct levels of colors. And that means that uh, that means the level of agreement of distinct GCMs for this specific RCP. Uh, in what will be gained and what will be lost in terms of suitable areas in the future compared to current environmental conditions. And that's a good way to represent uh, how variable your results can be. As you can see, some of the GCMs may be very exaggerated in detecting expansion of suitable areas, and some others may be like less uh less notorious in that sense in the same can happen with the losses another dimension of uh, variability in your results is what you can get from distinct parts of your modeling process or the distinct data that you can use so replicates for example if you produce replicates with bootstrap you'll end up with replicates that may look very different than the other, depending on the amount of data you have and how different environmental conditions are in distinct occurrences. And also 
if you have this thing models that were selected during model calibration that means you have different parameterizations you can also have distinct gcms used during model projection and distinct uh, emission scenarios distinct rcps used when we're doing model projection and this plot here summarizes the variance that comes from each source of variation and as you can see sometimes in some in, in distinct areas, distinct sources of variation can contribute more or less to the general variability in your model and or in your results. This is a different way to represent variability. And here you're seeing the results of the hierarchical partition of the variance in the results. And as you can see, sometimes replicates contribute a lot and other times Parameter settings contribute a lot, depending, of course, in how many they are. But uh, it's impressive how how big those sources of variability can be compared to general circulation models or uh, emission scenarios. So it's always important to explore those things because they can help you to detect uh, what will be the main sources of variability and perhaps uncertainty in your models although uncertainty is generally more associated with the biases and incompleteness of data rather than variability in kvnm you can also explore and summarize extrapolation risks in your uh, exercises or in the environmental conditions to which you want to project your models to and that's done using the mobility-oriented parity metric, the MOP analysis, which has the particularity that uh, it's really uh, detailed in the way it considers the irregularities in the environmental cloud of points that are in the calibration area and compares that cloud against the cloud of environmental conditions in the projection area. So basically, uh, all those processes are implemented in KUNM. And once you know that, you may want to explore the package. And for that, uh, first of all, I would like you to remember that KUNM doesn't have now a module that helps you to prepare data. But uh, so you have to do the job of clean your data, thin your data, define a good calibration area, select appropriately the projection scenarios if needed, and prepare and select uh, sets of predictors. So you'll have to organize your directory the way it's presented here in, in the part A of the figure. And the reason why is that KNM runs things reading information from your directory and writes the results in your directory and the main uh, idea behind that is that we don't want to suffer the pain of like stopping analysis because of lack of ram memory or ram memory related problems so KNM reads information from your directory and writes information, write results in your directory to avoid that kind of problem. Because you're gonna see later in the practice, you're, you're gonna generate a lot of information. So organizing your directory is an important part. And you can see in A, this is a project that considers at least two species. And each species is generally starting with this kind of information variables, distinct sets of variables for the calibration area, and uh, occurrence records that are all the occurrences records, occurrence records that you have in SP joint, for instance, and the ones that you're going to use for training and the ones that you're going to use for testing the model during model calibration. And finally, if you have the availability of them or you have those type of records, uh, some independent records that can be used for a final testing of your models. After running things in K 
K and M, you're gonna end up with a lot of results with a lot of different folders organizing all your results. And <clears throat> that way you can start like doing interpretations after all. But before running things in K and M, you have to remember that K and M uses Maxim and uses only the Java uh, implementation of Maxim. So for that, you have to get Maxim from the internet. You have to install Java and you have to install compilation tools because k &M needs to be installed with compilation tools in R, like R tools or Xcode for Mac, for instance. And after that, you can start, to start running. So now I'm going to uh, stop my presentation for now and I'm going to start the practice and in the practice first I'm going to show you something I'm going to share with town so he can make it available to you and so you have these three folders containing data to replicate the exercises and you have these folders here containing the scripts to do the exercises. The scripts in practice will have all the things I've done. And the other ones, the ones to complete will be the ones that you can use to start playing, replicating this and then use it with, use them with your own data if you want. So uh, I'm going to just show you how these scripts look like. They have this first part with information and then they have uh, some code already written. And actually it's most of it is already written, but you will have to complete each argument based on the help that you're going to consult for each uh, function. And you'll have four main exercises. One is producing KVNM with ASCII files, the way normally Maxim works. Then you have an exercise using KVNM with the SW format of Maxim, which uses CSV files instead of ASCII files. After that, you have an example for working with multiple species. And finally, you have an example of using other functions that are generally not considered in the workflow, but that are handy and they are useful for some of the things you may want to do. Okay, so those scripts will be the ones that you need to complete and I'm going to start using one of the ones that I already uh, modified. So I can, rip, I can do all the things without losing too much time writing. Just give me a sec here. And this is it. So let's start with the ask, working with variables in ASCII format. This information here just reminds you that uh, you need the variables and occurrences prepared already. If you have your own data. Okay. So let's go to our working directory. Here you have how to install KUNM. Remember, you need the other things so KUNM works. As I already have it, I am going to just load the library. Then I'm going to set my working directory, which is the one that you can see here. Then I'm going to start preparing my data. So as you can see here, I have just two files. This one contains all the occurrences of the species, and this one contains uh, occurrences for independent testing, just as an example. <clears throat> and you also have here variables in ASCII format, just four of them, and projection variables, which actually represent three distinct scenarios. One, a current scenario, which is an area a little bit bigger than the one we are using for calibration. And these two future scenarios for distinct RCPs, but just using one GCM in this case. Okay, so let's start processes. We're going to start preparing occurrences. We're going to use this function, which allows you to split data 
into training and testing data. I'm going to read the occurrences from the directory. And here are the occurrences. The name of the species is a little weird here, but don't pay attention to that. You can use your own species eventually. And it's important that the longitude goes first and then latitude. I'm going to just plant the seed for replicability, and I'm going to use this function to produce these files. So here we have occurrences joint, which are all the occurrences, and the testing and training occurrences. Here I am saying that I want to split the occurrences I have 70% 70, 70 for training and the rest for testing. And I'm going to use a random partition of the data and I'm going to save it to my directory. Uh, why random? Many people may ask. Uh, we believe that calibration needs to be done with data that represents the ecological niche of the species. Partition the data differently in place different risks, like uh, doing incomplete representations, more incomplete representations of the niche, or even extrapolation sometimes. So doing different types of partition of data, it's uh, maybe adequate for other purposes, but uh, for model calibration, let's we are going to use random selection right now. So we have already uh, points for testing and training and all the points. We're going now to prepare our variables. And the way we're going to do it is using this function to do combinations of variables. And this function produces all combinations of your variables with more than a minimum number that you establish here. So if I say I want all combinations of three variables and uh, of at least three variables of my four variables, I'm gonna see what I'm gonna get here. And the way to do that is to say, here is where my uh, variables are. Here is where I want the sets of variables to be. And what's the input format and the output format I want them. So now we have m variables, which is a folder that contains five sets of variables. And each set of variables has distinct variables, but at least, but each set has, a, has at least three variables, as you can see here. And the last set will have all the variables, okay? So now we're gonna see the effect of five distinct sets of variables in our models. And we're going to start the calibration process. So the KNM call function uh, helps you to create all the candidate models we were talking about in the presentation. So, and I have written here the code to define the arguments first because we will use those same arguments later in other functions. So those are my complete set of occurrences, my training occurrences the name of the folder where the sets of variables are. This is the name of a batch file or bash file if you're working in a Unix-based Unix system that this function will create to produce a Java code that will run the max and models. Uh, this is the output directory of the candidate models. These are the regularization multipliers I'm going to test. These are the distinct feature classes that you can use. By default, uh, this function uses all the combinations of feature classes that Maxim allows you to have, which are like 29. But it, it's not always practical to use all of them. It depends on the amount of data you have. It depends on what you are trying to model, either potential distribution or ecological niche. And so this decision is important because it takes time to produce and evaluate the models. So you have to be careful about this. And then you say here, what's the path of Maxen in your computer? And I have Maxen in the Z drive 
of my computer in this folder here. And it needs to be the complete part of the computer. That's important. So I think I run everything here and I'm going to run the calibration function. And that function will do what it just did. It will create the code for all the models there in this file, the batch cal file. And here is the Java code for all the Maxim models that you're going to test. In this case, you're going to test, as it says here, 90 models. And uh, then this will do all the Java code to run models and they will run here. And this window only appears in Windows, but uh, you can have something, it will run in Unix and in Mac the same way, but you won't see this window. So that will do all these folders here. All these models will be created one by one. Inside those, you'll have the models that will be tested later. And you have two models per each combination. Why is that? It's because you test partial rock animation rate using models that are constructed only with the training data, but you test AACC with models that are created with the complete set of occurrences. Okay, so notice that this argument here it says weight and it's set to false. That means that R is not working right now and everything is done outside R. So for that reason, you can start doing the evaluation of those candidate models immediately. And here I'm going to set the new arguments that we need, which are testing occurrences and where the results of calibrations are going to be. And here you're gonna see in the help of the function how to define all these other arguments. In this case is where the candidate models are, the complete set of occurrences, training set of occurrences, testing set of occurrences, where is the batch that says which models are done, <clears throat> where is the output of evaluation results, and other arguments that define how the partial rock is done, whether you keep those candidate models or erase them after selection, after evaluation, sorry, and the way it's selected, the way you select models. Uh, this argument, it's set to false because partial rock needs to be parallelized only if the region you're working with is too big and you have too many pixels. Um, so selection will be done the way I just described before in the presentation. You'll have first models that pass the criteria, criterion of statistical significance and then omission rates and then AACC but you have other options for selection here. You can check them. We'll recommend that one, that's why it's the default. So I'll start the evaluation. An evaluation usually takes uh, some time, not too much, uh, but I'm going to start describing what we have here below. And if the evaluation hasn't finished till that moment, until I describe everything here, then we can, uh, I'm going to stop the video for a, for a moment and then I'll renew it when we have the results. Uh, here we have, after evaluation, we can produce the, the models that were selected. And this is the function that does that. And for that, you need to say, uh, you need to say like a new file for the batch of the Java code for creating maximum models, uh, a directory where to say the final models. Um, in this case, we're going to produce uh, projections of final models to other scenarios. So you'll have to do the folder that contains the scenarios for projection. And I'll show you how to produce that, that folder. Uh, and then you do all the other arguments that you have here based on the help of the function. 
Later, we'll do an independent evaluation of the models. And we'll do that using the occurrences that I explained before. For that, we need the directory of the model, the, of the final models that we produce, uh, the complete set of occurrences, the independent occurrences, we need to say whether the model was done with replicates or not. We set a new directory for the evaluation of those final models and the results of that. And again, parameters that work with the, uh, that help to do the formation rate tests and the partial rock test. So that is all the ecological niche modeling process. And after that, we're going to do a MOP analysis that's going to help us to see where we are, uh, where we have a lot of risks of extrapolation. After that, uh, we're going to do the summary of results. And for that, we're going to do first the descript statist descriptive statistics of results uh, with this function here. We're going to need to define the name of the species. And the name of the species is going to be the one with which models are written in your directory. So in this case, as you can see, it's Amblyoma americanum underscore all. Then we have the directory where the model statistics are going to be written and so on. So you have your other parameters, of course. And I'm going to stop there because there are too many. And I'm going to say some other details that I forgot here. So look here, there's some cool things. For example, remember I told you about the extrapolation types. With this function, you can produce the models that were selected using all types of extrapolation that Maxon has. And that way, just with this function, you're going to produce all the selected models with all types of extrapolation, so you can explore all the implications that I was talking about. And that's a, a very unique uh, feature of KNM because it makes the process of model production very easy once you have done the calibration process. As you can see, the calibration of 90 models is about to finish. Uh, and now we're going to see that a folder is greeting. So after model calibration, we have this results here in this folder. And I invite you to review the HTML file that it's produced that summarizes all results. And here you have a brief summary of everything, the selected models, how everything looks like, and this kind of like plot, and all the 90 models and their performance. So once you have the selected model, you can proceed and create that model. And if you want, uh, project it. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to come back to the script. Uh, I stopped the video and because something happened, I don't know, but let's continue now. We're going to create the model with this function here. We're going to define what's the name of the batch, what the final model, the directory, and the variables we're going to use for model projection. I have already prepared them here. Since we saw the selected model had the set four of variables, we will prepare that set in this way for the projection variables. So we have G variables, inside that the name of the set. And then you have here the three scenarios to which models will be projected. I'm going to produce the models now. And 
as you can see here, one of extremely useful uh, feature of, of this program is that you can produce all extrapolation types at once and your final models will be produced with those characteristics in terms of extrapolation. So you will be able to explore what happens in model projections, whether you um, use extrapolation and clamping, free extrapolation or no extrapolation. Okay, so at the end, you're gonna have your folders full of models like this. And Maxim produces very uh, easy to read results and checking them and see carefully what they have. It's an important thing to do because they, they help you to understand what's going on with your model, how you can do interpretation of variables, variable contribution to models. These are the projections to the calibration area. Those are future scenarios. And this is the current scenario. As you can see, things don't look too good for the future in this scenario. But of course, we have, this is just an example, a made up example that is not, it's not easy to interpret to do interpretations and it's not uh, probably true for the species. I just wanted to show you how it looks like, how the variable responses or the suitability response to variable looks like, how the jackknife uh, is telling you which variables are contributing the most. And the same you can see for the model with free extrapolation. for which you have a different answer now. Here you see that there is a lot more predictions expected in those areas than with extrapolation and clamping. And the same will be for the model with no extrapolation. So you can go ahead and check all of those once you have finished. But we will continue with this exercise so we can finish. And after that, we're gonna do the evolution with independent data. For that, we're gonna use this function. We're gonna need the directory where the models are, the complete set of occurrences, independent occurrences, whether the model was replicated or not, and a new directory for the outputs. And these other parameters that are by default like that, but you can play with them. So I'm going to produce the evaluation. This one should run really fast. And it's telling us that all models meet the criteria and emission rates and partial rocks are safe for this model in specific. But this was just one. You can have multiple models if the calibration process ends up with more than one answer. After that, we'll do the MOP analysis. So, what we need to do is here is this function, which produces multiple mob analysis if more than one set is used, or if in the same set you have multiple scenarios that you would like to compare with the calibration one. So for that, I'm going to define a new directory, mob result. I'm going to tell the program what's the set that we're going to be looking for. We're gonna tell the program what are the names of the directories with variables of projection, directory of the variable with uh, in the calibration area, and where the mob is gonna be greeting. This is, these are other parameters that allow you to use a percent, the closest percentage of the cloud of M and compare that to the environmental conditions in the projection area. And here, if you increase that, it's going to be a more strict comparison. And if you decrease it, it's gonna be faster, but also like it's gonna take into account the closest points to the uh, conditions in projection area. I'm going to do it 
in parallel because it will run faster. And we'll see how the, so for the moment, this is the performance of my computer and you'll see how things change when I start this process. So this is telling me 33% of the complete process is uh, running. And that means that I'm doing it for one of three scenarios of projection. As you can see, memory and the CPU usage has jumped up. And here you can see the advance of the process. This will take a little bit, so I'm going to stop uh, my present my video, but I'll resume it uh, immediately after it's finished. As you can see, the process is about to finish. And we have now in our folder the results of final model evaluation that we did before, and also the results from MOP. Here is a brief description to help you understand what you're seeing here. But basically, uh, it's gonna show you the levels of similarity between the calibration area and these scenarios of projection. And the values of zero will represent areas of where strict extrapolation risks are very high. So that means that none of the variables is similar to uh, the projection area compared to the calibration area. Okay, so let's continue with the summary of results from modeling outputs. And here we will do model statistics. So we have our final models here. We're going to use those models to calculate uh, the median, the median and the range of predictions. And let's add here. Let's see the help and what other statistics we have. Let's add the standard deviation. And let's see what we can get. Again, we have to define the name of the species that is in your um, CSV file. The name where the final model statistics will be written to of the folder and other other uh, arguments that you need to check reading the functions help. So I'm going to start producing those and I'm going to explain you here a little bit. Here the only thing I'm saying is that the models were projected. The statistics I want to measure whether the models were replicated or not and which ones were the projection scenarios. And in this case, they were current and these two for the future. Also, I am just using uh, the results that were obtained with free extrapolation uh, because that will make process faster. That's the only reason why. So we have final model of statistics and here you have separated statistics for free extrapolation and if you do all here then you will have the three folders as well and here we have uh, calibration median range standard deviation in the same for all the other ones so <clears throat> some of these ones are uh, in this case since we have just one final model will be very will be the same actually the median for example to the one that uh, Maxin is giving you. But if you have more than one model, this becomes very uh, useful because that will create a more consensual uh, result. Then let's do a uh, detection of changes of suitable areas in the future. So for that, we'll use this function here and what we need to define is which one is the current projection. If you don't have a current projection, uh, the model will take only the calibration area projection as the current one. 
but your future scenarios will need to like fit exactly that extent as well. And the mission scenarios we're using are these two. And basically we're telling the program what's the pattern to look for in your uh, directory. And we need the complete set of occurrences. We need the uh, folder where the model statistics are and uh, a threshold value for binarization, the pattern for current uh, projections, emission scenarios. Again, we're going to say just to work with uh, free extrapolation, and this is the output directory. Okay, so after running this, the function is going to tell you you don't have different time periods, so just one will be considered. You don't have different climate models, will be, which will be like the GCMs, and the process is done. So. In this folder here, you'll find description of the result you just got. And here, well organized all the condition, all the results. So for period one, which will be just one period in this case, we have for the two RCPs, what's the binary comparison between current and future conditions and the continuous comparisons of results. And here you have a folder with the binary uh, projections. Okay. So now, as you can see, our, our directory is uh, starting to fill up uh, with different results. And then let's continue with the, I think the probably our last function here in this script. This one helps us to measure the variance coming from distinct sources to our final uh, results to our projections. So basically here again, we need to define the species name, the mm, directory of final models, we need to tell whether model is replicated or not, the format of files, whether the model is projected or not, what's the current pattern, the pattern for emission scenarios, the extrapolation type we're working with. Uh, this argument helps you to handle uh, multiple files when you have many models at the end. So you reduce this number, your computer is going to suffer less because of RAM limitations. And here's the directory where the results will be. And after running this, we're going to see here size variation in free extrapolation. We have variation in calibration area. We only have variation from replicates in this case. Uh, for projection areas, same thing, for current. And then for the first time, we have variation from replicates and variation from emission scenarios. And why is that? Because for our future projections, we have those two uh, sources of variability in our models. But for the current projection, we just have one scenario and for calibration area as well. Sometimes here in the future, uh, you can have also general circulation models. And if you have more than one model selected during model calibration, you'll have that source of variation as well. And if you have projections to multiple years uh, in the future, they will be listed here differently because those cannot be compared in those terms of variance. And the last function I want to show you here is one that allows you to see where multiple GCMs coincide in terms of risk of extrapolation. Since we're not using here multiple GCMs, general circulation models for future projections, we won't see any 
agreement we will see only uh, how the mob results look like in binary terms in these two in these two periods for the current will be just the mob result again okay and that's all the exercise with ASCII file as you can see it's long it it takes some time uh, here we did a very simple example but you can make it as complex as you want but always defining arguments and button parameters in terms of or depending on your needs and and what's the goal of your research uh, i hope this uh this script is useful as an example and if you want to practice with the other ones it will be perfect with your with your own data data even better because as i say this is only a uh, sample data and it's not as reliable as your own and i'm going to stop again to later start uh, recording the, the other exercise okay now let's start with the next example and the next example is the one that uses Maxim in SWD format. For that, again, I have here the occurrences, the variables in ASCII format, and the projection variables. Okay, I'm going to explain later what's the difference between these two. And now let's open the script I have prepared for that and the script is this one remember you have another script with all the arguments still to be filled by you and you can just take this one as an example and the first thing to do is i have to do is to explain you what's the difference between what we just did with ascii files and this what we're going to do uh, with uh, this swd format the main difference is that you work instead of with raster layers with CSV files and that speeds up the process a lot and also allows you to make more informed decisions in terms of what background to use for calibrating the models and stuff like that. So <clears throat> here I'm going to present the example I have. Uh, we're going to use KNM and raster for variable processing. I'm going to define the directory here. This directory you're seeing here. Uh, I'm going to read the occurrences there. And I'm going to read the variables in the variables directory. And these are our variables here. And we're going to use uh, for this example this function, which is prepared SWD. And the arguments we need are the occurrences that we just read. We need to tell what's the name of the columns that contain species information, longitude, and latitude information. We need to tell the way we want to split records, the proportion for records to be split. Uh, we need to tell what are the raster layers we're going to use, what's the sample size of our background, what is the uh, what are the sets we want to produce, sets of variables, and in this case we want all combinations of more than three variables of these layers. Okay, uh, it's asking us if we want to save or not the results. We do want to save them, and the way we're going to save it is with this prefix for occurrences and then join, train, and test will be added accordingly. And this folder here is going to contain our background CSV files instead of M variables like last time. And this is just to uh, assure replicability. So let's do this. And that's going to sample the layer that we have here to produce a background and for that background we're going to produce distinct sets of variables distinct numbers of variables 
And let's just see an example, Z1, Z4. Uh, Z1 has three variables, Z4 as well, but they are distinct variables, as you can see here. They are distinct combinations of variables. And you can produce your own background files, but the only uh, thing to, to, to be careful about is that your background sets must include all your uh, occurrence data because later we're going to test uh, omission rates and partial rock and AICCs. And for that, we need the background to, to have all those records as well. Okay, so once we have the data prepared, again, occurrences, the three occurrences we need, the background and all the sets of variables, we're gonna use this function to produce the complete process of calibration. This is production of candidate models and evaluation of those candidate models. This is a little bit more uh, straightforward than the other uh, set of functions because it's actually easy to manage those CSV files. So let's start checking the function. Please read the help of, the, of these functions. It's very useful. And most of the time the questions are received in my email uh, actually can be answered with just reading the functions of the, the help of these functions. So just take a, a, a good look at those uh, document, help documents, and you'll be fine. Of course, you can send me questions at any point. I'll be happy to answer them, but sometimes I take some time because sometimes I can, I'm kind of busy. So here is the function. And what I did here was just define the arguments previously, because again, we will need some of them here. And we'll run this process. And again, here you have your candidate models being produced and here is the evaluation bar and i don't know if you notice but this runs faster and this as well it's faster than previously but uh you will really notice that when your area of uh, of calibration or your the number of pixels in those area in that area is is really really big Okay, so I'll just explain here again the selection argument. Uh, and this args here that was also in the KNM call and KNM mod functions that we used before. It's very useful because you can set other things for maximum there. In the functions help, you're gonna find a long list of things that you can do with those args. And one of those is the use of bias files. And bias files may be important when, when you want to uh, modify the way Maxim is assigning suitabilities or is considering suitabilities in your model according to uh, a bias that is representing, for example, how uh, sampling has been done in an area or similar things that can be consulted in different published papers and in the help of Maxim. Okay, in this example also, I just prepare things for doing the calibration and evaluation and then producing the final models because the other things will be basically the same. Then, after this is done, I'm going to start running the uh, models, the final models. And the difference between this SWD format and the previous one is that you have to produce a projection to your own calibration area because you're working with just with numbers, just with CSV files. And if you want a geographic projection of your model in the calibration area, you'll have to do it 
this way. Okay. Uh, I'm going to stop this and we'll be back in a sec. Okay, so the process is finished and we have again our calibration results here. Let's go and check them. And here we have something that is important. Look at this here. It says that no models met the omission rate criteria. And if we check it, the selected model has a mission rate above 0 0.05, which will be 5%. And that means that your model or this model is not performing as expecting in predicting the test uh, occurrences. Uh, and that may be uh, sometimes dangerous, but in this case, in a specific, it's not as bad. KUNN will give you the models that have the lowest emission rate if this criteria this criterion is not met. But you have always to check which models were selected uh, and see whether that omission is acceptable or not. In this case, we consider it acceptable because it's not as bad and we'll proceed to produce the final model and to do so we're going to use this version we'll run it again uh variables in g i had them prepared already and we'll do pro projections just to current and calibration areas only and I guess this time I asked only for uh, free extrapolation type of extrapolation for Maxim. So we'll have just one folder like this. And as you can see, Maxim has finished. And here we'll have our models again. Here we have the calibration prediction, and here we have our prediction to the current area. And in this case, a different set of variables was selected. This curve here looks really good. This one doesn't look as good and this one either. Uh, again, you like always to have something like that, but in real life, it has, it's always complicated. And we call this type of curves truncated curves because uh, actually, let me explain that here. These lines here indicate where conditions in M or in the calibration area end. And then the difference in extrapolation, no extrapolation, free extrapolation, no extrapolation in clamping, you can see it actually here. When you have clamping in this border, your prediction of suitability will go like this. It will continue the same level that it ends in this border. No extrapolation will go until this limit and then decrease completely to zero. And this is what we have with free extrapolation. Free extrapolation here looks almost like clamping, but because the curve was going to do something like that anyway. And here we have the curve just following the trend. That's what free extrapolation does generally. Okay. So uh, this is the importance of seeing what type of extrapolation fits better your model. And this is telling you to be careful about predictions in values of bio 15 below that one. And same thing for this one for bio five values below this level will be extrapolative and will always be, or will be maintained high most of the time. <clears throat> even if those values are very, very low, like very, very low here. Okay. So uh, again, you have the same results than before. And this will be our example with SWD format in KUNM. Now let's go to our next practice. The next practice will be with multiple species. 
and this is what we have. This is a working directory, the project directory that was in the plot that I presented in the presentation. And here you have three species. The three species have the same information we had for the SWD format uh, presented before. And if you notice, there is something that is uh, very similar among all of them. They all have the same num names of folders and the CSV file inside. And why is important? It's important because KVNM doesn't actually handle it, handle this kind of project with multiple species with a specific function. What we do is call the functions through all these folders using loops. And loops are actually really simple in our, let's see the example script we have here. Here it is. Here I have some information for you. And the key to do that, to do this is to do uh, loops. You can use normal loops or applies, but you can also do parallel processing, which is will be uh, sometimes very useful if you have multiple species in a very good computer. And one of the keys here is also using the paste function because we use a lot of just names of files or directories in, in your working directory. So it will be easy for you to prepare the arguments as needed. So let's load a package. Let's remove all we have here, just in case. Let's load the package. Let's set a working directory here. Let's see what we have. And those are three species. Let's make a vector of these three species. And now I'm going to paste that vector of three species with the names of the files that I'm going to use. Now, as you can see, we have three uh, distinct files that will be read in our environment here. Again, we'll have the name is for three of the viable folders that will be read here, one for each species. And these are names that will be used for writing our occurrences for training and testing. And this will be used for creating the background directory for each of the species. We're going to do it actually using the SWD format and because it's faster. So inside the loop, what you need to do is just be careful about what you're doing here. For example, we're using this vector of, that contains uh, occurrences for all the species. You're gonna read that to your environment, but you're gonna change that with every iteration. And you do the for loop this way, you're going to stack the, the variables that are inside these folders of variables for each species, changing it every time. And then you will prepare the uh, files that the way you need it and the folders the way you need it with this function. Here again, changing these names according to the loop. Let's do it. And this should be really fast. So in this case, background, it's already done for the first pages as well as the occurrences the way we need them. And as you, as you can see here, they are all done. They are all, they have all the same names, but they differ in that they are in the stream directories and that's the way to work with KVNM and multiple species. <clears throat> now we're going to do the calibration. So we're going to tell again, pasting all the species with the names of the files that we are going to use. We're going to paste those things accordingly for each of the files we need. And then we're going to define also our regularization multipliers, feature classes, and the max and directory. 
here we have the batch file that we used to do where the candidate models will be and where the calibration results will go and then again we have the function and then we have here our uh, variables that we just created here the object that we just created here with the names that we need changing according to the loop for each species so if you do it once it will be the same thing every time you need it uh, but we're i am not a fan of doing things for too many species because it takes a lot of work but also because uh, not everything can be automated uh, and you have to be careful about interpretations that you saw before so for every species you have to do a lot of work and sometimes you just uh, have to go by one by one especially when, when doing the interpretations okay so let's run this uh, i added here small thing that's telling me when one species finished and here more candidate models are running here the evaluation is being done <clears throat> and i'm going to pause the video and resume it when the process is finished and i'll show you all the results okay the process for the three species is about to finish as you can see here and here i wanted to show you the results that we obtained so this model it's exactly the same we obtained before because what I did for this example was just copy the same thing three times. Uh, again, just for demonstrating how you can do this kind of things with QNM. And we'll have all of that all the same for the three processes. Yep. And so what I'm going to do is proceed to <clears throat> produce the final models. Uh, G variables are already here with their uh, calibration and current layers. Uh, those here results for the third species, which is the same species but in different folder and let's do the final models so again well, let's define the batch file that's going to be created uh, where the projection layers you can see for all species the same and they'll put for the final models again here inside you have all the uh, arguments changing according to the loop we'll do only extrapolation free extrapolation projections and let's do it and i changed another thing here what i did was to change the weight argument and uh, instead of false i put, i made it true that means that the models won't run in the black window that you just saw but inside are and you can see here that the model is running right now so it finished for the first species and the model is here and again the same thing with the projections since the bootstrap is random every time you're gonna have a little bit different uh, curves and responses and also like these kind of maps. <clears throat> but they are looked in general the same than the previous result. And since what we did was just to change, what I did was just to change the species name folder, all the models will be the same. 
Uh, so the models for the final species, for the third species are being produced right now. And this is almost done. Okay, so this is the way KNM can be used for calibrating models and producing final models. And actually for using all the other functions as well in a project in which you're managing different species. But again, the most important part here is to prepare correctly your data and to do the previous steps really carefully. Now let's do the final exercise. And the final exercise consists in using this last script that is here, individual tests, that shows you how to use certain functions that are inside KUNM that you won't see in a normal ENM workflow like the one we did here. But can be they can be very useful if you need to do principal component analysis of rasters, for instance. Okay, so we'll use a name and a raster again. The working directory in this case, it's going to be the ASCII exercise because there we have almost everything. And so what we're gonna do here is do principal component analysis first. And you can do that with this function. Uh, one of the things with this is that you have the chance to do principal component analysis for a set of variables, but you can project them as well. And that means that you're gonna use the rotations of this so the principal component analysis that you produce with your variables in the calibration region, for instance, and then use those rotations to transform your variables in a projection scenario that can be a larger area or a different environmental scenario in terms of climatic conditions in the future or the past. And that can be very useful because that's the actually the right way to proceed when you are doing projections using PCA. Okay, so first let's go here and we have the variables uh, folder and we have the, in the variables in ASCII format. We want to scale them because we have temperature and precipitation variables. We're gonna write the results in output format ASCII and we're going to write them in the PCA results directory that the function will create. And we're not going to project those results. So let's do that. And this can be saved in, a, in an object in R as well. But again, I, I leave it like that so you can check here easily the results. And we have already the PCA results. Here are the layers of the PCs and here the details of the PCA, yeah. Okay, so now let's uh, do a PCA with projections. And for that, I'm going to copy a folder. So let me see if I have it here. I think it's here, okay. Yes, it is here in our directory projection variables, which will be the three scenarios to which we projected the models. And I'm going to explain you how to, how does this work. So you have again variables as the main variables to produce the PCA, the four in format, the scale of variables, writing results. Now we're going to do the project, the outputs in uh, TIFF format. And this is where we're going to save these new results. But this, in this case, we're going to project the result. And for that, we're going to use all the scenarios that we have in projection variables. And that's the way to define that folder. That folder will contain other folders with distinct scenarios. Even if you have just one, just make that folder and save there the variables. One important condition is that the variables must be named the same way they are named in uh, the initial folder, okay? So we'll do this process. 
and that will produce this new folder with the initial pieces in TIFF format. Again, this is not going to change, it's going to be similar. It's going to tell you the loadings or rotations for each variable and the summary of your PCA. But now you have three other scenarios with the PCs. You have here four PCs, here other four, here other four for these other conditions. And the cool thing is that once you are creating your model in your calibration area, then you'll be projecting your models to other areas that are following the same trend that your initial pieces. And that's important. Okay, so that was PCA using KUNM. Now we're going to do partial row. Sometimes I, I receive a lot of emails asking if they can do partial row outside of the calibration process. And yes, you can do it. You can do it with this function. In this function, you have you'll need uh, the occurrences that you can you use for testing the models. So that means the occurrences that were not used for producing the model, but only the longitude and latitude in that order. Then you will need a model that you want to evaluate. In this case, it's a model created with the training occurrences that in your directory of candidate models will be named at the end CAL. And then you'll use the function with the test occurrences and the model using a threshold, a random percentage for bootstrapping, and a number of iterations for producing the partial rock. And then at the end, the partial rock will have two components. One is the summary, and the other one is all the results of all iterations, okay? And that's partial rock in KUNM. The other one that I recently received emails about is emission rates. For that, you will use this function. You will <clears throat> use the training occurrences, but also the testing occurrences, but we already read them here. I'm just going to copy that again here, just in case someone forgets. You need both occurrences and the ENM again. Again, this ENM must have been produced with the training occurrences and you're going to be able to uh, assess omission rates with the testing occurrences. You set a threshold, in this case, 5%, and you get the results. Uh, in this case, the under this threshold, the omission rate is above the expected one. But let's try this vector, as I said. And cool thing about this function is that it's vectorized, so you can get multiple emission rates if you use multiple thresholds. Okay, now let's check the AACC calculation. This function is based on what was presented by Warren Seyfried in 2011, and then it was implemented, I guess, the first time in our in the ENM eval package. We, find, we have made some modifications. And we have a version of this function that works with raster and another that works with numerical values. You can explore them. The other one is just AACC, the one that works with uh, numerical values. You can, go in, you can go ahead and check it. And for that, we're gonna need all occurrences that we use for produce a model with all occurrences again. And we're gonna need the lambdas file. You can read the lambdas file with this function, read lines. And we're gonna get the number of parameters in that specific model from the lambdas file. And the lambdas file looks something, looks like something like this. Uh, here you have linear uh, lambdas produced for this 
variables and here you have quadratic responses of those variables um, and the number of parameters is going to be uh, all the variables that you are you have listed here that have values other than zero in this first number here okay so in this case you have one two three four five six lambdas six parameters and that's what you're going to use here in this function along with the complete set of occurrences and the uh, model created with those occurrences and once you run this uh, you have the values the AHCC the value of delta AHC is not relevant in this case because you're only testing one model <clears throat> but you can test more of course, you have to uh, add a vector of number of parameters for each of those models. Oh, and one more thing, uh, you can do uh, mops, mop analysis for a single layers as well, separately. If you have not single layers, but single uh, comparisons, let's call it like that. If you have used a different algorithm, but you still are interested in uh, measuring extrapolation risks in your projections, then you can use this function. And this one has just one M in MOP as compared with the previous one that we use in the complete process. And we're gonna need this uh, stack of the raster layers for uh, the calibration area and a stack for the raster layers of the projection area or projection scenario. The MOP also can handle uh, numerical values in M, like the ones that we use for background in the SWD format. But you necessarily need uh, raster layers in the projection area, okay? So let's produce this. And I'm going to increase the number of codes here. Let's just put six and see if we can finish this sooner and again that's going to make our computer suffer a little bit because we're doing parallel processing but this is uh, not as bad because this area is uh, not that big either i'm going to pause the video again a little bit and i'll be back in a sec Okay, the mop is almost done. We can check the results. Uh, as you can see, it takes a lot of your processing capacity because it's a complex process. The mop is a complex process and it's difficult to make it uh, less, uh, how can I say that? Like less expensive in terms of computational power. Let's see our results. And the first thing we want to check is uh, the MOP in terms of similarity. This scale is not the greatest, but here we're seeing that all this area here in the current area is very similar to uh, our calibration area, which is actually something like this. But th there are some regions that are less similar, even close to this, like very very similar parts and then of course we have regions that are completely different and if we want to check the regions that are strict extrapolative we can do this rule if we say all mob that is equal to zero we're going to see this so values of one here represent areas of strict extrapolation risks in our predictions for the current scenario Okay, and that's the way the mob is interpreted. And I hope these examples were clear enough so you can replicate them. And I hope you can practice with your own data as well. Now I'm going to return to the presentation and let's uh, just answer some frequently asked questions about the program. The first one is why does KUNM uses file in the directory instead of objects in R? 
but that's true for most of the KVNM package, but not for all things, as you just saw. Some things are done with objects in R. You have to read information to do the things. <clears throat> but mainly the reason with the reason why we do that is to avoid uh, problems related to RAM uh, limitations. The other question is, uh, why do I need compilation tools to install QNN? Uh, and the reason why is because Luis, one of the programmers uh, behind QNN, uh, was able to obtain uh, options written in C++ that need to be compiled before using it. And of course, if KNM will be if KNM will be in, in Cran, you will need them. But until that happens, you still need compilation tools to install the package. And why KNM is not in Cran? Well, it's because it takes a lot of work to uh, prepare a package to make it to Cran. And this effort we have made, uh, it's uh, aside of all the other things we are doing. And we're taking some time, but we're learning and we're trying to make it uh, even better before trying to make it to Cran. And yes, it's going to be in Cran sometime. Can I change other parameters of Maxon to KUNM? Uh, yes, you can do that. Check the argument arcs in the KUNM call, KUNM call SWD, and KUNM mod functions, uh, KUNM mod SWD as well. You have you can change most of things from KUNM that you can change in Maxon, but some of them are advanced features, and you need to do it with. Uh, being careful. And with that, thank you very much for your attention and uh, thanks to Town, Luis, Narayani. Without them, QNM won't exist. And you can find more, more information in these uh, links.